Hey guys, so today on Her Best Fucking Life podcast, we have Denise Duffield Thomas, which if you have not checked out her books yet, I highly suggest you check them out. I am currently, well, I started one and then another one came out, so then I started listening to the new one, so I'm kind of <laughs> backtracking now. Um, but Denise is known for her books, Get, Lip, Get Rich, Lucky Bitch, Chillpreneur is her newest one, and her OG is Lucky Bitch, which honestly, I haven't even read the first one yet, so I feel like I'm going backwards but it's okay. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to hand it over to Denise, let her tell you guys a little bit about herself, who she is, and then we will jump right into this interview today. Thank you, Sarah. So I call myself a money mindset mentor, which is a totally made up um, job title, but basically I help women um, change their relationship with money. So get over their fear of money, um, get over their fear of charging for what they do, and really um, allow themselves to make all the money that they want so they can be, do, and have everything they want in the world. And I, I write books about money and business and make it really non-scary. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm a mindset coach. So I think the mindset piece is so, so super important for everybody. And it's the thing that makes everything else easier. Yeah, definitely the way your your brain works, the way you're thinking about things is going to frame how everything goes. And I want to pull, this is so funny, I went on your website just a little while ago just to dig into some stuff before. And there was a quote on one of your pages that I pulled because I was like, I just have to call this out in the beginning of the episode. You you said, quote, I'm like a gateway drug to a lifelong affair with money. <laughs> and I yes. died because I was like, I love that. That's like so perfect. I absolutely love it so much. So yes. And you know what? We've, we're not allowed to love money. You know, right? so many of us feel so much guilt around the idea of loving money as a tool to help you create amazing things in the world. Yes. And one of the reasons I found you and I started reading Get Rich Lucky Bitches because I myself have been one of those people that I think there's so many of us that struggle with it, but we struggle with the idea of making a lot of money or we like sabotage ourselves or we have this weird like mindfuck relationship around money where we want it, but we're like sabotaging ourselves or we're not comfortable with it or we're not doing things to get more of it. And so it can get so twisted. So that's why I was super excited because I started that book for that reason. So what is like, why do you think people get money blocks so terribly the way they do? I know mine personally, I think came from my parents because yeah, well, it was the yeah. way I grew up with money. But what do you think is some of the other big reasons that people develop these crazy blocks when it comes to money? Well, definitely the parents thing is, is huge because that's our first interaction with money. Very often the very first thing we've ever been told about money is to take money out of our mouth because money is dirty. That's a very first interaction because most of us have, as a kid, tried to put in a coin or a, a note into our mouth. So that's definitely where it comes from. But you think of a larger societal kind of influence because countries have money blocks, you know, and I think for America in particular, it's all about you have to work really hard to make money and working hard is a badge of honor for a lot of Western countries. Um, for us in Australia, it's not having more than other people. It's being, everything has to be fair. And if you make more than others, then you feel like you're not part of the community. You're not being a mate to people. Mm -hmm. um, maybe in other countries like Ireland, for example, has a very strong history and strong generational trauma of the famine. And so there's an, there's an inherited fear there when it comes around that. And then you look at other countries as well. Some, some countries have got the equality thing. So in Europe, it definitely, again, you have to be the same as everyone else in some countries, some Scandinavian countries that is. So, you know, we've got these, these things that we inherit. And then you think of some of the stuff that we have around gender. Mm -hmm. um, so countries, again, societies, again, have this thing about women should share, women should be nice. All of those things can really give us some warped views around money and earning money. So when you think of all that stuff, you have to kind of go, oh, no wonder I'm struggling a little bit with what to charge or how I feel about money or asking for a raise, because there's a lot of inherited stuff that you're trying to wade through. Unfortunately, women often internalize that and think, oh, it's because I'm not ambitious enough. 
or maybe I'm not smart enough, or maybe I need another certificate and then my money stuff will be fixed. And it, it won't be, you've got to dig into it from a lot of different angles to kind of figure out why you're sabotaging it. Right. And kind of something you mentioned there that I want to run off is I, how I think so many women today get that like hustle need to work crazy amounts of hours, like the hashtag hustle. Oh my gosh. Like (laughs) I used to be one of those people and now I'm like, I don't want to hustle. Like it's not necessary. (laughs) So that's why when you came out with Chillpreneur, literally I stopped listening to your other book and I was like, oh, this is so me right now because that's what I've kind of gone on this year is like this work less, enjoy my life more, but still be successful type of thing. So I definitely want to talk about Chillpreneur because I am halfway through it right now. I'm listening to it on Audible, but I... I'm loving everything in it so far. And there are so many things about money blocks in it that I think just correlate so much with the whole overworking ourselves and being crazy and all that. And like you mentioned, the work hard to make money, thinking that an honest day's work will reflect the money you're making and that old school mentality and feeling guilty if you don't work enough. And that's something like when I heard that in your book, I was like, oh my God, that's me. Like I would find myself almost like making excuses sometimes to my fiance about like, oh, I did this, this, and this earlier today. Like if I wasn't busy later. And then when I heard you talk about it in the book, I was like, oh my God, that's so accurate. So, so accurate that we sometimes have that weird attitude that if we're not working hard enough, we almost don't deserve the money we're getting in return. Absolutely. This is why a lot of entrepreneurs um, resist outsourcing. Mm -hmm. resist delegating, resist building a team, resist um, passive income, you know, or creating a course or making things easier for themselves um, because it doesn't feel like they've earned it and it feels like they're cheating. And so then they sabotage it or they don't do it in the first place. Right. I know. And I always tell everyone, I'm like, there's so many ways to make money on the internet today. That it. Oh my God. And you don't have to do so many. <laughs> I tell I know, people all the time, it feels so weird because it's like, oh, I just made this money not doing anything on the internet. Like this is crazy. But yeah, it's nuts how much money you can make on the internet today with things like passive income and all of that. Absolutely. And I don't know if you've gotten to the part of the book yet, but I, I took right at the that's, end. That's what oh, I was. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, your grandmother like would have, my grandmother would have used the opportunities that I have to get out of a bad marriage or to, you know, live her dreams. And there's so many of us who have all these opportunities at our fingertips. And even when I started my business, there wasn't things like PayPal Mm -hmm. or, you know, drag and drop websites. And we're sitting here with all this wealth at our fingertips. And it's not about being a scammer and finding some internet scam. It's about giving your knowledge and skills and talents to the people who want to buy them. And you have all the tools in the world to do that. And we're somehow still sitting back thinking, oh no, I'm too scared or it's not my time or I'm not qualified enough. Screw that. Your grandmother would have loved your opportunities and her grandmother would have loved your opportunities. Amen. I agree. (laughs) So one of the things that I also loved when you talked about having a success hangover in the book because I felt this so strong. We just bought a house and you mentioned in the book about buying a new house and like feeling ashamed or guilty or like scared to show it to people. And I was like, I totally resonated with that feeling because I felt similarly. And like you talk about, it's the mindset, like understanding that you deserve the things you work hard for and you shouldn't feel bad about them. Absolutely. And congratulations on your new house, Thank by the way. You. Um, <laughs> What I find too is that sometimes we'll have people in our lives who actually are not happy for our success. Mm -hmm. And that can feel really weird as well because it sometimes just takes one comment from somebody to really kind of derail your happiness. And it it makes you very vulnerable, I feel, to then further sabotage yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it's really super important that you have people in your life who celebrate you, who champion everything that you do, and who congratulate you when good things happen. And I've got friends in my life who have said to me, oh my God, I'm so jealous, but I am owning that. Mm -hmm. You know, and then when good things happen to them, same thing, I'll go, oh my God, you're so amazing. You've inspired me to like get my butt into gear. And you need people like that 
in, in your life. And I don't know when we're going to air with this, but for the month, month of March, we've got um, a book club open mm-hmm. for Chilpreneur. And, you know, that's a great place to talk with other people who have that similar mindset to you. And it's crucial that you pick the right mentors, the right mastermind buddies, the right, you know, business friends, um, because otherwise it's really easy to then take on other people's stuff in your life who aren't necessarily in this same world. Right. Yeah. A lot of it has to do with the people you surround yourself with. And I always love that quote to like, watch for the people that clap for you when you're like doing well and those positive influences that aren't going to be like secretly hating you because you did something good or worked hard for something. Um, so yeah, love that. And one of the, okay. So you mentioned this in the book of a mantra that you said out loud in the car with your husband. And I thought it was the funniest story about how you said there's always more money and then money literally hit your car. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I laughed. No, I laughed so hard. And I was literally driving home as I was listening to it. And I was like, I'm very, I get into the spiritual and the woo stuff. And so I was driving and I was like, there is always more money. And I like said it out loud kind of to myself. And I literally shit you not. I had a merch order come through right after I said it. And I was like, damn it, Denise. <laughs> like it worked. <laughs> but That's I so good. That gives but me I goosebumps. Loved, yeah. I loved that story in your book when you talk about that. Cause it's so crazy. Like how powerful your mindset and manifesting can be when you really start believing something. Absolutely. And um, for those of you who haven't read the book, I was driving to our house that we had just bought, um, which we're actually we're in the process of building. So we were driving to like an abandoned building, but, um, and I was say, I was feeling really stressed about money. And I was saying to Mark, we're going to have to tighten our belts. Like, you know, this is bigger than what we've ever done before. And he said, Oh, that doesn't sound like you. And I said, you're right. There's always more money. And as I said that, a wad of $50 notes, and in Australia, they're bright yellow, so you cannot miss them, um, hit our car. And it was at least $1,000 worth, if not more. It was the craziest thing ever. And it it blew all around the road. And we were just in hysterics because I was like, did you see that? Like, Mark's like, do we stop? And I was like, no, this is a busy road. And that's actually not the lesson. The, The lesson from the universe isn't, oh, here's some extra money, you know, that belongs to someone else. The the message was there is always more money. And I always say that to entrepreneurs. I'm like, there are more clients out there for Mm -hmm. you. There are more opportunities. There are more books you can write. There are more courses you can, you can write. There's so much opportunity. And it's not like you need all of the clients in the world. You only need a few. Um, And the funny thing is um, I drive past that spot at least twice a day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and it, and it just is always such a great reminder that there's always more money. Um yeah. and yeah. So that was fu- that was a fun thing that happened but know, the I universe know. will it's give not, you those things. <laughs> I believe it honestly. And I think, you know, so many people get in that mentality, even people that are like starting something new and they're like, "Oh, the market is so oversaturated. Like there's so many people already doing it. Like what if I'm not going to be successful?" And kind of like you said, like there's always going to be clients. There's always going to be people. The universe is always going to bring them right to you if you're trying to draw them in and attract them. So I I love that. I love that vibe because I like you said mindset is so important and the way we think and the way we talk and like the energies we're putting in and out, it it can directly like impact those things and whether they happen or not. Absolutely. And you know, you talked about the word hustle and I don't mind the word completely, but Mm -hmm. I think it's being co-opted by, you know, this sense that you have to do it 24 seven right? and it's unsustainable. And I mean, there are times I have to work in my business for sure. There are times when, you know, I stay up late very rarely these days, but it still happens. Um, And so sometimes I think some people feel like they can just do nothing and they'll make money. And that's not true either. So, I mean, it doesn't roll off the tongue, but I always think chustle, chilled hustle. It's like, sometimes you just got to, you got to do the work, but if you don't procrastinate and sabotage it, you can do the work quickly and then you can go to the movies with a friend. Yeah. Um, you, you can't hustle 24 seven. It's just, it's impossible. No, you'll burn out. You'll die out. You won't have the passion. You know, you just won't have a good quality of life either. No. And not everything in your business is worthy of equal amounts of hustle. Right. Um, some people are, are really bad at deciding what, what should be worked on and what shouldn't. And they think everything is equally important. And that sends you down some rabbit holes because you think, oh my God, I've got to do Snapchat and, and Insta stories and Facebook lives. 
and you know you're trying to do everything and that's exhausting too so yeah. I, I find if you just focus on a few things and just like hustle on when you need to and and on the things that are important and let go of the rest Right. And that idea of kind of like simplifying and minimizing and not spreading yourself too thin. I really latched onto the idea in your book about the keyless life when you talked about the keyless entry to your car and how it makes it so much easier to get into your car. And I loved that idea because I just was like, I love it because so many people I feel like struggle to do that. Like, where can I make things easier? Where can I simplify? Where can I reduce the stress and the work? And I loved the story about your like keyless car entry. And I was like, that's such a good, you know, way to relate it because sometimes those little things you can simplify can make huge, huge impacts in your life. Yeah, they can. And I love when people send me their keyless life ideas. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, the thing that I'm upset that I didn't get in the book is fanny packs because I love (laughs) even (laughs) just the idea of having your hands free to do yeah. stuff. I'm like so thrilled that fanny packs are coming back in. But um, in Australia, we call them bum bags. Okay. We don't call them fanny packs. We call them bum bags. But it's just that concept of like, how can you make something easier for yourself? And right. sometimes it's, it's the small things that actually make a massive difference in your life. And one thing I mentioned in the book too, is that I've got phone charges in every room Mm -hmm. and I've got extra cables for my laptop. And I actually went away a couple of weeks ago and I packed my phone charger from my bedroom. And I'm so annoyed at myself because so many times I go to bed and go, Oh, I don't have my phone charger. So this has happened in the last week. So I'll go in my office and grab my phone charger from there, move it over. And then I come into my office in the morning. I'm like, no phone charger. (laughs) And you might think, that's so whatever that's pathetic but that that takes up energy little things like that take up energy that then stops you from doing the things that are important to you so find those little friction things in your in your day and eliminate them and you'll find you've got so much more space for the things that you really want to do right and speaking of removing things to remove friction um you talked about how you don't have to serve everyone, find what works for you, what doesn't, and all those things. And something I have personally done this year was I, I made one online course. It was called the Mindset Makeover Course. And it was my first one. And I put a shit ton of time into it. I did videos and worksheets and all this stuff. And then at the end of it, I ended up feeling like, I don't like online courses aren't my zone of genius. Like that's not what I want to focus on. So I'm actually removing them all this year. And you talked a lot on your uh, book about the app you created, which you're actually going to be probably getting rid of. It sounds (laughs) like that you, you made an an iPhone version, but not an Android version. (laughs) And it's funny, it's funny because (laughs) I'm sure you can relate. Like when I was at first going to get rid of my online courses, I had this whole like oh my God, but what if I miss out on something? But what if this, but what if that? And you have all these like thoughts about it. And at the end of the day, it was like, if it's not making me feel good, if it's not bringing in all this positivity and it's not like coming from my heart and soul, then like, fuck it, like get rid of it and focus on the things that do. Yes, absolutely. However, though, I think we sometimes like with, with courses, that is passive income, you know? So sometimes, you know, I I might push back a little bit on that and, and have a look and see, maybe you can tweak it because one of my first online courses was called the raw brides transformation formula in 2009, when I was wanted to coach women getting married, Mm -hmm. totally the wrong business for me. But that course, I used the framework of that course to create my next course which was, you know, because mindset is mindset. Right. You follow a process no matter what you're teaching people. And then in 2011, I created a course called the Inspired Life Formula based very much on that, on, on that first course. And then 2012, I created my Money Boot Camp, same framework as that Inspired Life Formula as the Royal Brides. And that's the course that has made me millions and millions of dollars and mm-hmm. has helped me help thousands of women. So, um, I think there's that thing too, of not throwing the baby out with the bath water and Mm -hmm. making tweaks. I think sometimes in your business can be so powerful and, and knowing that nothing is wasted. Like the, the skills that you got from creating that course, you can use forever. You know, you know how to write a sales page now, you know how to do videos. All of that stuff is so valuable. Um, and it's never, never a waste. 
Yeah, no, it was definitely a great learning experience. It actually, I mean, it honestly didn't do terrible. Like the, I was pretty successful mm. as far as like sales and everything. I just felt like I wasn't fully like in it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's okay for not everything in your business though, to be, right. you know, like, you know, I, and I think I, I think it's an important lesson. I'm not picking on you. No, so, go for but, it. I would love to um, learn from you. So tell me. <laughs> I think I hear this a lot though. It's like, I'm not allowed to make money unless I am like 100% like involved and hundred percent in love with this. Mm -hmm. And I think in business, yes, everything should be in aligned. Like if you don't feel like that course is in integrity, then for sure, let it go. But sometimes there's something there about this expectation that we have to um, put our heart, soul, sweat, tears into everything we do, or it doesn't count. Mm -hmm. However, it's not a, it's not about us. It's about our clients. And if your right. clients love that course, you know, maybe just put it on evergreen and it doesn't have anything of you in there. I mean, I've got a course that, um, is my manifesting course and it's an audio course. I'm not, th I'm not there in a forum helping people with it. And it's, I keep on thinking, I'm going to let that course go. And people are like, no, we love it. Really? You know, we love That's it. so funny. <laughs> yes. And it's the same with my app. And I'm glad you brought that up because a few people this week have said, no, don't get rid of the app. We love it so much. And, I, and I'm saying to them, but I don't even use the app. Like right. I don't use it. And then I thought, but that's, it's got nothing to do with me. You know, like if people True. love it and it's useful for them, it's not out of integrity for me just because I regret that I spent the money on it. Um, right it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating thing. And I think, you know, this week I've really gone, Oh yeah, that could be a sabotage. Like maybe people really love it and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, just cause I don't love it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it, it's complex, right. You know, I'm not saying yeah. don't ditch it, but I, I just want to give people listening a little, like just a little tweak sometimes in thinking, Oh, it's a, it's also okay for things to be a business. Right. Um, and for me to not feel like, I'm cheating if I don't 100% love everything in my business. Right. Yeah, no, no, yeah. I appreciate it. I love learning. I love people's open criticism on anything. So <laughs> I will take it. Don't you worry. Uh, so I loved it also when you talked about how to design your business for you and kind of narrowing in on like, how many hours do you want to work? Where do you want to work? When do you want to work? And kind of like tailoring it for what's going to work best for you and help you be the most successful in your business. And I, that's the thing, like, I feel like I switched that up so much from time to time. And at first I felt like that was almost like wrong. And it was like, no, I should have this like totally. consistent, consistent, consistent. And then the more I kind of tweaked it, it was like, no, like sometimes I work better in my living room on the couch. You know what I mean? Sometimes I do like to be at a desk. So I really liked hearing about how you've been able to tweak and design your business for the way that would work best for you. So I'm curious, what, what did you learn about yourself in that? Like, where did you figure out that you work best? Well, what I figured out was that I felt, felt really guilty doing that because we're told the customer's always right. And you've got to, you know, run your, your life to serve them. Mm -hmm. And actually I'm going through this right now. So this is a real world example. Um, I'm organizing a book tour in Australia and I thought, what's going to be the easiest for me? And so um, I'm actually doing them at cinemas. So there's a cinema chain oh, in Australia. Oh. Yeah. And, um, and they have nice cinemas. And I just thought, I'm going to do that at, at cinemas because there is one point of contact, one company. Um, they do them in every state. And then I was thinking, oh, but, the, you know, but people want to come and like see me at a beach you know, cafe or something like that, or like a really beachy, sunny kind of place, not like a dark room. Right. And I thought, well, you know what? That doesn't work for me. And then people were saying, why are you doing it midweek and during the day and not at night and on the weekends? And, you know, I've got kids. I don't want to be away on the weekends. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, that doesn't work for me. And, and so some part of me was going, well, people aren't going to come if it doesn't work for them. And I thought, here's the thing that came up for me. If I'm not doing it the way it works for me, I will not do it at all. Like I can't make it happen. So either it inconveniences a few people or they just, or it won't exist. Mm -hmm. And that's my choice sometimes. And that's the choice sometimes we have in business. It's like, yes, not everyone's going to love this, but if it's not designed for me, then I will not even be able to serve one person with this yeah. because I will not be able to sustain it. And for me, I can't, 
I don't want to do it at night. I'm like a nana. I need to be in bed at nine thirty. <laughs> um, you know, and um, yeah, <laughs> yes. And, I'm like, no, I'm not I going can't. out past nine on the weekends. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> never. No, no, no. So it has to work for me. Otherwise it won't happen. Does that make sense? Absolutely. No, I totally agree. Cause I feel like if you're doing something in a way that you don't want to do it, you, you almost like self-sabotage, you push back on it. And you have that like resentment, like you're almost, not that you're dreading it, but you carry that kind of like, ugh, I really wish this wasn't at night. I really wish I was at home. So no, I totally get it. That you have to make things work for you and worry about yourself. And then it's just like you offer what you offer, you know, and if people don't like it, it's like, well, this is literally what I have to offer. So it's right. okay if you don't like it, yeah. but that's all I can offer. Um, and that, I think that helps you feel okay about it mm -hmm. because if you think of what we've been told from a very young age again is like you get what you get and you don't get upset that's what mm -hmm. that's what teachers in Australia teach their kids by the way here um Willow learned it at daycare she learned it at school and they just parrot that you get what you get and you don't get upset and I think wow we're so taught that we have to we have to do things like that mm -hmm. and you know and I say to her yes but you can negotiate you know, oh, you yeah. can negotiate. And that's the thing with us in our business. It's like, well, we don't have to put up with that. We can negotiate. We can, we can decide what kind of clients we want to work with and we can decide um, how we want to live and the conditions by which we offer our offering into the mm -hmm. world. And if people don't like that, well, then they can just not take your offering. That's okay. Right. right. Yeah. That you can't please everyone. I always love that um, phrase about how like you could be the ju juiciest peach and someone's always going to hate peaches because it's so true. You could do things trying to please everyone. I think it's unrealistic because at the end of the day, there's always going to be someone that's not going to like something that's going to complain about something or it's not going to be something that works for them. And it's like, don't change everything about what you're doing and how you're doing it just to please those other people. Absolutely. Because sometimes they don't buy anyway. Right. The first person to complain <laughs> will be the first person that doesn't show up. <laughs> oh, yes. Or they're the first ones to get a refund, ask for a refund. I, right. I've seen it so many times now. And, you know, and sometimes I'll still go, oh, okay, let me help you with that. And then I always regret it. I'm like, <laughs> no. <laughs> right. No. And here's the thing that I've, I've been saying a lot lately. It's okay for people to save up to work with you. You know, mm -hmm. we live in this instant gratification culture where people sort of say to you, well, I can't afford your work. What are you going to do about it? And it's like, well, save up. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's, what do you want me to do? Yeah, no, I love you brought that up because um, a friend of mine, she's also a coach and she just got certified and everything. And we were talking about it and she was like, so many people contact me and are like, oh yes, I would love to work with you. I'd love to do this. And then she's like, I send over my offers, which she's like, you know, are appropriate. And like, I've experienced this too. And then people are suddenly like, oh, oh, well, I don't have the money. Well, I can't do that. Like they want it all for free and suddenly can't figure out how to make it happen. And that's what we talk about a lot. We're like, you know, we just did our first like small live event in the Detroit area here. And mm -hmm. we had a lot of people saying like, we charge $25 for a ticket. And included both of us talking, we had, right? Worksheets. We had food and everything like put up this cute little event at the salon in the area here. And we had a lot of people making comments about the $25 ticket. And I was like, really? It is $25. <laughs> and we kind of talked about that though, because we thought like, okay, are we charging too much? Should we try to adjust this or anything? But it was like, no, that's the value of what we've put together and we're worth this. It and is. And it's true. People will, if they really want to work with you, if they're really interested, if they're really invested and they want to commit, they will find a way to make it happen. Haven't you done that in the past? Absolutely. Yes. I've charged I've gone, things, <laughs> you know? Yep. You've gone and found a client to pay, yep. to pay for that. Absolutely. Yep. And so we can't let people off the hook. But here's something I've discovered recently. Mm, it's really, really fun. When you have a lot of people complaining about your price, here's what you have to do. You have okay. to double your prices. Okay. Yeah. You don't reduce them. You actually have to double them and the problem goes away. Um, and I, I, I've made the mistake as well. I actually priced a course r wrongly last year. And mm -hmm. I was so annoyed because we, um, we didn't get the result that we wanted to in our launch. And I was like, what's the problem? And I went, it's actually too cheap. It's too oh, cheap really? because okay. yes, because the people who were attracted to that price, but people who actually couldn't afford it or who were, you know, thinking, 
um, oh, I need dis- I need a discount or, you know, they were the ones complaining about the price. Whereas the people who were wanted to buy it actually thought it was too cheap. And so it set it up in their mind of, well, what am I going to learn out of this course? It's too cheap. If it's so like, what am I going to learn? Yeah. Absolutely. And I did this myself this week. I was looking for a gift to buy a friend mm-hmm. and I saw um, in the back of a magazine, like these beautiful necklaces. And I thought, oh, that would be perfect because it's a special occasion. And so I went to their website and I was going, oh, this one's perfect. This one's perfect. And then I was like, oh, it's only, it was like $60. Mm-hmm. And in my mind, I wanted to spend like $250 because I, I thought, well, this is a really special, I want something that's special and something that she'll, mm-hmm. you know, keep. And, and so I was like, oh, even though the necklace was the same in my mind, in that moment, I was just like, oh, that's not, that's not expensive enough to be special. Yeah. You know the value of it in your own head. Honestly. With the yes, yeah. I did. And I thought, oh, maybe it's not as good as it's photographed. And so it might be amazing. And the person selling it might, you know, have just been really underselling themselves. But it's funny that we always think, oh, cheap is better, but it's not. And for some of your customers, actually the price reflects what they think that they're going to get out of that thing or it reflects something about themselves and if I was just buying a necklace for myself you know like I would have been like oh 60 yeah that's that's fine but in my mind I was thinking this is something that's special so the price for me did not reflect its specialness (laughs) right yeah no I love that and like that pushback you always fear getting but it's like you know if people are willing to invest in something they want they will think that it's something of value if they're willing to invest that kind of money. And especially with like coaching and stuff, I mean, I think that's going to give you people that are more invested, more committed, more, you know, they're going to put a lot more heart into it and work really hard. I actually, this is totally a side note. I actually run a hair and makeup company here in Detroit for weddings. I have my cosmetology oh, cool. license. And it was funny because we, uh, we won a, like a bunch of awards locally. And when I raised our prices, I did get some pushback similar. And you know, for a while, everybody was like, well, maybe it's too much. Like maybe that's too expensive. And I was just like, no, 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 because I want people to have in their head. Like if you're paying this high price point for a luxury service, like you're going to get a luxury service. Like I want to instill that in them. I, I literally, I'm all over the place. I do a lot of things. (laughs) No, I think what you said is really great. Cause we, we think, oh, cheap is good. Expensive is bad. Yeah. Or some people think the other way, right? So some people think, oh, cheap, yuck. And oh, expensive, that's me. Mm-hmm. So there's no right or wrong, but it's all about who you want to attract. And it's okay for some people to say, you know what? That's not for me anymore. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. You can't force all of your target customers to come along with you on the journey. Some people are happy to shop at Target and Armani. Oprah Winfrey is one of those people. She <laughs> shops at Target. She shops at Armani. But you can't force one to be the other. You can't force a target customer to pay Armani prices. You can't force a solely Armani person to pay target prices. It's against who they are. Mm -hmm. Um, And obviously, you know, some people can't afford it. But also it's it's just, it's okay for people to not like your prices. That's okay. Yeah, you're not for everyone and that's fine. But you might find that you have a, a completely different clientele at a different price point. Yeah. No, that's so, so true. So true. Not better or worse, just different. Just different. Yeah. Yeah. Different. No, I love a it. Different person. And that's okay. Yeah. So I can't wait to finish Chillpreneur first of all, because I, <laughs> I'm almost done, but I am loving it. And like, what, what brought this idea out for you? Did it come from talking to people with the money blocks and kind of hearing how they had these weird feelings about how they had to like hustle and work hard to make money? Is that where it came from the whole idea? Um, it came from a very specific incident. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I've always loved business, so I knew I wanted to write a business book at some point because my first two books are more about manifesting and money. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I identify as an entrepreneur very deeply. It's very important to me. But um, I did notice, especially when I had kids and especially when I was more around the female entrepreneur mm-hmm. environment, I realized how much of my business advice came from men. Okay. Which is fine, but I think men have a different, generally speaking, um, have a different approach to work than I think a lot of women do. And I was discovering that as I was getting older and didn't want to work as much and really trying to honor, um, 
my self-care and honor being a parent and being a woman and honoring, you know, the cycles of being a woman. And I went, oh my God, I don't want to hustle like a man anymore. (laughs) That doesn't feel good to me. And I had my second baby and I was, I had time to read books because I was literally had just had, had him and it was at home and I was like, oh, this business book that I've had on my shelf for a while, it's time to crack this baby open. And I was reading in that book about this man who like just worked all day, all night, slept three hours. And I was just like, what the fuck? Like, (laughs) and I just went, no. And I was so pissed off about it. And then I just went, but that works for his audience. Mm -hmm. That's okay for him to write like that for his audience, but that's not me. And so, you know, when you sometimes go, who's going to write, who's going to write a book? And then you're like, yes. oh, maybe I should write that book. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, and so that's when I started writing Chillpreneur. And I'm, I'm so happy that it resonates with people because I feel like since I wrote it, there is this movement, I think, of um, do less minimalism for business. And so I just feel like it's it's come out at the perfect time where people are ready for that lesson. And also it's okay for people to live that life. But mm-hmm. I just wanted to provide a different, a different way of being. Yeah, no. And I appreciate that. Cause I think, like you said, it did come out at the perfect time. Cause I think we just went through that whole like boss babe thing where everyone was like hustle boss babe all the time. And now I think even and it might have something to do with the age of those people because myself, I was all in that. And now I'm 30 and it's like, Oh, I'm getting married. We just bought a house. And I'm in that mode where I'm like, okay, but I want to step back a little bit. I want to take care of myself. I want to like enjoy my life to the fullest, which, you know, like you said, some people love to work hard and that fills them up and that's great. But I think there is like a chunk of women like me now, like you said, that are like, okay, I did that, but now it's time for me to, you know, shift my life and make it into a new routine that's going to work for me more. Yes, absolutely. I think that's, It is a stage of life thing, but it also is a personality thing too. Mm -hmm. You know, some people just can't work at that pace. Right. Um, And also I think, I think the counterintuitive thing for a lot of people is you don't choose to have like a laid back life in business and therefore you can only make a certain amount of money. My philosophy, I think with this book is to say, oh no, you can have both. You can totally have the money and the big business and the success, but you don't have to work as hard for it as you think that you did. I love it. Love it because that's where I'm at and I'm soaking it all in. (laughs) Yay! I know it's such a beautiful, it's a beautiful way to feel. (laughs) Yeah. So what are you working on next? If you don't mind, if it's not top secret, what's going on? um, It's not super, super secret, but um, the reason why I probably won't talk about it too much publicly is because, Mm -hmm. you know, this book just came out obviously. And, um, and so what I'm working on now, books have a very long lead time, by the way. So I started working on Chillpreneur in um, like June, 2016 and we're in, you know, like it came out Feb, 2019. So it's a long process. So if I want to book out in like three years, I have to work on it now. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm actually going to pitch my, my publisher, a book about um, business and babies. So for, for moms and mompreneurs. I'm going to pitch that to them, but the book that I am working on, and I'm actually having my first meeting with my book coach this afternoon is um, a book about how my husband and I got married 87 times in a year to try and break a Guinness world record. And um, it's, I'd love it to be made into a movie. I think it could, it could be a really fun, like romantic comedy. Oh my it doesn't gosh, have anything yeah. to do with business. <laughs> no, um, That's why I'm like, I don't talk about it too much. But for me, I think I'm at a stage of business too, where my business runs very well without me. And it actually has given me some time and creative space. And I often preach to people, you know, focus on your business, don't get distracted. But you do get to a point where it's like, well, cool. You've done those things now. Now you can do some, some other creative projects. Yeah, you so, can branch out in different directions. That's, that's exciting. That sounds Absolutely. like a great story. I would, it sounds like a typical, like Nicholas Sparks, like the notebook type movie. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And it will be so much fun because I think, you know, people can go and watch it with their girlfriends and wear a wedding dress if they want to, to go see the movie. 
Um, so that's what I'm starting working on. I've been thinking about it for a long time. It actually happened 10 years ago. Um, and it's like, oh, now's the time for that project yeah. to have its life. Um, yeah. So I hired a book coach. I'm really into accountability. I think whenever you have a big project that you want to do, a chillpreneur way to do it is to hire a coach or hire mm-hmm. someone to give you accountability. Otherwise you probably won't do it. So who would play you in that movie? I'm curious. Oh my God. Have, I think do you have a one, like a person in mind? <laughs> I do actually. I would love Amy Schumer to play me. Oh I think gosh. she would be so yes. much fun. Yes. I love Amy Schumer. She is super funny. She is the best. And I feel really bad for her at the moment. I actually want someone to send her my book because, you know, she got pregnant and then she went on this big tour and during the tour, she was announcing new dates and she was sick and she had to cancel a whole bunch. And I just think, oh, I've seen her do that over the last couple of years, like really, 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 really work, 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 work. And I'm like, someone send her my book because yeah. especially now that she's going to have a baby, I'm like, you can chill a little bit. Right. <laughs> you don't have I to know. do all the things. I've been following her on social media and I've seen that too. And I'm like, oh, poor thing. Like she's pregnant and sick and <laughs> I'm like poor little babe. But, and this is why I think setting up your business before things like that happen, yeah. you know, before you want to have kids or we don't know what the future holds, you know, you might go through a period of, of being ill, you know, like I'm, I'm a bit sick at the moment as you can hear. And, you know, like last night, the ba- our baby was up all night. And I just think I'm so happy that my life is pretty well oiled now that it, it actually doesn't impact too much stuff. You know, I can, I have the systems in place and I have a team in place and my life isn't over full that I can't, it, it doesn't all go to crap, you know, and things happen in life. You know, parents get sick and friends get sick and partners get sick and we want to move house or we want to move country or we want to have kids or you just want to go to more yoga or you have, you know, all these things can happen. So it's like, do it now before those things happen. Right. I love it. So why don't you go ahead and tell everybody listening where they can find you, if they want to connect with you on social media, your website, your books, give them the 411 of where they can find you. Yeah. So it's really easy to find me. I'm at denisedt.com. That's also my social handles everywhere. I personally prefer Instagram. Um, Instagram is so much more fun. (laughs) <laughs> it's so much more fun. I'm like, oh, Twitter feels like uh, I am on Twitter and uh, on Facebook. But for me, what I love is when people, you know, like take a screenshot of um, the podcast artwork and tag us both mm-hmm. and tell us your aha from from this podcast because yeah. that's that gives me life. I love hearing about that and I love hearing what you're actually doing with the information. Yes. So and yeah, definitely action. tag us both on Instagram. Yeah. I love it. Take, take action, but take the right action. Don't feel like you have to do everything. Take the one action that's going to move you forward today. Right. Love it. So thank you so much, Denise, for coming on and chatting today. You guys, if you haven't checked out her books yet, I highly recommend checking them out. Chillpreneur is the new one. It is amazing. But again, thank you for coming on, for chatting with me today and being a part of the show. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks everybody.